Okay. So hello everyone. Welcome to join today's webinar. So I'm Bing Zhou Han from Jim Pharmatech. Today's webinar topic is knockout all project genetically modified mouse models and their applications. So I don't want to under, you know, introduce too much about that lab animal studies have dri dramatically driven the biomedical research, especially during the last decades. So it is also announced by the Nobel Prize Committee in Medicine. So among all the model animals, mice occupy a very important position since it has the several advantages I have listed here, including the close genetic relationship with humans and the developed and applied mammal tools genetic tools, and also the clear genetic background annotation of the strains. And also besides that, about the genetic and the molecular biology steps, the physiology of this model includes small body size, a relatively short lifespan, and a strong reproduction capacity made it essential for our biomedical research. As announced by Professor Tillman, the mouse sequence will be the receptor stone that will help us interpret the human genome. So, sorry. So, when we use animals as models for medical, medical research, we need to obtain mutants in, in order to study the function of the genes and the relationship with genes and the phenotypes and consequence they cause. So, in the earliest days, people used spontaneous mutations generated through natural breeding or use physical, chemical, or biological ways to randomly induce mutations in the genome, like use X-ray radiation, the ENU, or gene trap, retrovirus infection, etc. So these methods are together called by forward genetics, which means that we get the phenotype we want first, and then we use positional cloning or other stuff to identify the causing gene of these random induced mutation or spontaneous mutations, and then we find the correlation underlying the mutation and the phenotype. And but during the development of the genetics tools later, we have got this gene modification or gene targeting strategies, either based on embryonic stem cells or using engineered endonuclases. So in this way, we will use this method to mutate the genes of interest first, and then usually will breed them into homozygous knockouts and then see the consequence of the homozygous knockout. Because this process is in reverse of the traditional way in which we obtain the random mutations first and we see the phenotype of interest and then we trace back to the causing gene. So this is in reverse. We mutate the gene first and then we get the corresponding phenotype. So it is called reverse genetics. Although reverse genetics developed later in the biologic field, this method is now more popular and uh, essential in current medical research as well as industry. So here's a brief introduction about the development of genome editing technology, which is also the development of the reverse genetics tools. So since the discovery of DNA double helix structure by Watson Crick and their colleagues in 1953, and also development of other methods, including the Sanger sequencing by Sanger. And then we know the gene and their function, their sequence and their arrangement in the chromosome. And finally, at 1982, scientists developed this embryonic stem cell-based homologous recombination method in mouse ES cells, and then successfully target the endogenous gene in the mouse genome and generate the knockout individuals in mice. This is the first generation of the genome editing technology. And then after near decades, the Zig finger nucleus, which is the fusion of the Zig finger DNA bonding domain of the transcription factors and the, the DNA in the nucleus domain of book one together to generate a sequence specific DNA targeting. And then this so-called engineered in the nucleus is developed and applied into animals. So this is so-called the second generation. So based on the further development of other engineered 
the nucleases like the tail in the nucleus and also the popular crispr cage system it enters the third generation of the genome editing technology area which means that we can easily manipulate the genome as we want in current stages so what's the advantage of the crispr case line system especially compared with the traditional embryonic non stem cell targeting in mice since the embryonic cell targeting strategy is first generated in mice and is well applied in the past you know 30 to 40 years and we have multiple strains here but also if we want to generate a new strain there's certain advantages that embryonic stem cell can't achieve but crispr case can so it includes the reduced timelines to generate the mutated mouse. So you can see from the chart, here, from, from the figure here, that the time period from injection to we get the heterozygous mass or even further the homozygous is similar. But for CRISPR case based strategies, we simply, we simply inject the case 9, the guide RNA and the whole system into a one cell stage embryo. We don't need the first transfection of the targeting vector and then culture and screening of the embryonic stem cell process. So in this case, we will shorten this by 12 to 14 weeks in this process. And then since embryonic stem cell can only be generated in a few backgrounds, including the 129 or the Black 6N, but not the commonly used strains like Black 6J or BioBC, but for CRISPR case 9, the limitation is not, it's no longer exists, does not, does not, <coughs> no longer exists since in this case, most models with various genetic backgrounds can be generated through the CRISPR case 9 system. And last but not least, the efficiency of CRISPR case is relatively high. So this is our internal data that for the knockout strains that we have a germline transmission rate of injected and the born founders as high as 84.3%, which means that the generation of knockout is, you know, for every injection, it will success with a very few amount of injected embryos and form pups. So after this simple background introduction, we'll go into the introduction of the mouse genome modification strategy first. So for genome modification, it can be easily classified into these you know, different styles like the conventional knockout or conditional knockout. Or we can knock in sequences to achieve multiple functions and purposes like we can knock in exogenous coding sequence to generate overexpression of genes. Or we can knock in regulatory sequence like promoters, enhancers. And also we can generate point mutations. It is very useful, especially if it is homologous to some human disease causing mutations. And last but not least, we can introduce reporter genes or tags into the genes for us to do like limit tracing or labeling of some specific cells or tissues. We can also combine these modifications together to generate complex modifications, like we can target multiple genes simultaneously we can overexpress different sequences like a coding sequence with a point mutation and a reporter symboling its expression simultaneously. And also we can substitute an endogenous mice gene with a human gene, so-called gene humanized modification. So last but not least, as long as the curious case line is very powerful and can generate a lot of things for us, the traditional transgenic technology also has its part to play in the model construction. So in gene pharmatech, the common engineering most genetic backgrounds we have experienced in including all the you know inbred strains we commonly use like C fifty seven, Black Six J and Black Six N, LBC, NOD background, the amino efficient NCG background, and etc. And also we can pro provide the you know, services based on SD racks. Let's go detailedly through the strategies and the types of genome editing. The first is the conventional knockout, which is very common and easy to achieve. But also we have something to talk about the styles, like we have three different ways that we design a strategy for conventional knockout. So the first one is the most used one, is that we design 
two CRISPR Cage9 slash targeting introns of the target gene, and then the targeting will result in the deletion of the essential coding axons of this gene. So in this case, we can avoid multiple problems like the frame-shaped ATG styles or other tran incomplete truncation of the genes. So in the second case, we can also use one target set at the axon to generate a frame-shaped knockout mutation on the axons. Since our in mice and other in in the nuclear, sorry, in the other organisms, the non-homologous injection is the major pathway for us to repair the double strand breaks. And during this non-homologous injection process, random insertions or mutations may be introduced in this cleaved double strand break here. So introducing a random base or base substitution, insertion, or deletion. So if the Insertion and deletion is not, cannot be fully divided by three. It will generate a frame shift mutation here. Then this frame shift mutation may cause a downstream premature stop codon and then causing the gene to be truncated and loss of function. However, in this case, some cases, there will be an in-frame start codon, which is ATG in most of the carols. In this case, it may generate a you know, N-terminus truncated protein, which remains part of the function of the endogenous gene. So this method is now less popular compared with the first methods. And in some cases, if there's only one essential axon and there's important you know, regularity sequence here, we must use this strategy instead. So in the third case, if we want to disrupt the gene's function and also some of the regulatory sequence, or we want to you know, delete multiple tendon genes, we need to use this complete knockout by designing the first target site upstream of the sequence we want to delete, and then the second target site downstream of the sequence we want to remove. And then in this case, we will generate a complete knockout of the gene body or even multiple genes. The efficiency of knockout is high using either of these strategies, as we as showed in the background. Conventional knockout, certainly you know, is a powerful tool for us to dissect the gene function. However, there are certain cases that conventional knockout cannot achieve our purpose, like when the knockout leads to an embryonic, prenatal, or neonatal lethality. If we are not studying developmental biology and we need them to survive in adulthood, conventional knockout may not be a good approach for us to do this. And also, in the following case, when the mechanism study is complicated, like the knockout will lead to abnormality in multiple tissues or organs, or there's possible secondary effect caused by crosstalk between these cells or tissues. Like, let's take some genes, like for example, like if this gene will influence the cardiovascular development and uh, generate some defects during the, in the cardiovascular system, but it will survive into adulthood. And we see that there's some you know, motion problem. So we cannot easily tell that the reason is about the cardiovascular system or it is about the motor system or the muscles development. So also other cases like gene compensation or functional difference in different development stages or ages may also require complicated and uh, elegant methods other than conventional knockout. So in this case, scientists introduced the conditional knockout approach in the study. So most conditional knockout in mice rely on the Crelox P system and some now the a novel recombination system called the Rock system. So this system is based on the recombination activity we will introduce later. So for generation of the conditional knockout, we need to first generate the allele with multiple Lox P's or rocks introduced into the target gene so-called flux or flux alleles. So let's here take lux P as an example to, for convenience of this presentation. So we will generally design two target sites like knockouts flanking the essential axon or axons of the target gene. And then we give them two donor sequence, each containing homologous arms and the lux P sequence together. And the injection of this system together into the embryo will cause the integration of the to lock piece into the targeted allele. 
simultaneously, and then if this allele is transmitted into the next generation and stabilized, inherited, we can successfully generate this allele with two loxies flanking the essential axon or axons, so called a flux allele. And then after the application of a Cre transgenic strain with Cre expression in the tissues of cells of interest, Cre will mediate the recombination of these LOXP sequences and cause the deletion of the sequence between LOXP and remove or remove the vital essential axons, causing the loss of function of the gene. So let's briefly go through the you know, principle of Cray lox system. This system is originated from virus and it will create cause recombination protein will cause recombination of the LOX T sequence, which is a you know, symmetri partially symmetrical sequence, and the, the core of this sequence is not symmetrical and symmetric, and it will you know, decide the, the direction of this sequence. So two LOX with the same direction after query recombination will result in the removal of the sequence between these two LOX pieces. So if, if this is the sequence between these two LOX, Box piece is a gene or the essential coding sequence of the gene. The application of query recombinants will lead to loss of function of the gene. So, in practical work, we will use a tissue specific cry driver line and cross it with flux with mice bearing flux alleles and generate a query positive flux allele homozygous mice. And in the cells or tissues expressing query recombinants, the sequence between the lox piece will be recombinated and removed from the genome, leading to the loss of function of the gene of interest. In this case, it will generate a tissue-specific knockout. For further application, when people want to use an inducible or time-specific knockout of the flux allele, which means that we can only generate the loss of function after we give a induce in our drug application. So in this case, researchers fused a mutated estrogen receptor domain to the C terminus of the Cray recombinant, which is called Cray ERT2. And this fusion will lead to the expression of this Cray ERT2 fusion protein. And in normal cases, this protein won't go inside the nucleus of the cell then we will prevent the query recombinants to interact with the genome and then cause the recombination of LOX piece. But after we administrate the agonist or the ligand of the ERT2 domain, which is tamoxifen or 4 hydroxyl tamoxifen, it will bind to the ERT2 domain, causing the release of the query ERT2 from the cytoplasm and the entrance of the nucleus, and then mediate LOX T recombination. And thus, Gen thus achieve a inducible time-specific knockout. So we already said that for conditional knockout, we need to generate flux lines, and also we need query lines. So for generation of query lines, we can use knocking strategy. So this is two general schematics for knocking. The first is that we knock in the genes of interest or the operating frame of interest. It can be a query recombinant, it can be an overexpression of another gene, it can be a reporter, or et cetera, to the five prime, the upstream of the coding sequence of the type of the endogenous gene. And also we can introduce this concept, this sequence in downstream of the gene's coding sequence, like in the pattern stop coding of this gene. So what's the difference between these two designs? So we can see that in this first design, we introduce a polyadenation signal, which is a transition termination signal, or even with insulators in this sequence. So in this case, the transcription starts here but ends here. Then the endogenous gene won't be expressed. So in this in this method, the endogenous gene's function will be disrupted. So, however, when we usually introduce sequence to the downstream of this gene's coding sequence, we will use a linker like GS linker, EAK linker, or actin linkers, and or other protein linker sequences, or we can use two-way tap tests to separate the translation of the 
first endogenous protein and the operating frame we introduce later. And or we can use an array sequence to generate independent translation of this endogenous gene and the downstream overriding frame. So in other case, we need a linker to separate this together. And the, what, why we do this is we want to maintain the endogenous genes expression and function. So what is worthwhile to say is that these linkers and also the type test sequence can also be introduced in this five prime targeting methods to substitute the polyadmission signal. In this case, the endogenous genes function will more likely to be also you know, maintained. But the iron sequence, which is the translation initiation sequence from the virus, is not recommended to be introduced here. Since the expression level or the translation level of the average is not comparable to the endogenous translation initiation set. So the introduction, introduced introduction of virus here will lead to the, the knockdown-like effect of the endogenous gene which will lower the expression level of the downstream gene, endogenous gene. So for expression of exogenous sequences like query communists, reporters, or just simply overexpression of other genes, other than uh, targeted knock-in, we can also use the traditional transgene technology, which commonly we use a uh, you know, linearized double-strand DNA sequence and introduce and uh, inject it directly into one cell stage embryos and it may go through random insertion into the genome, and then the promoter will drive the gene operating from of interest and other sequence to express in the genome. But this is a random process. It is not easy for us to you know, identify where exactly this sequence is introduced into the, in the genome, and also the copy number of this. We need to we need additional methods and efforts to you know, identify the copy numbers. And also in this case, we can introduce back engineer and back clones in through transgenic methods. In this case, we can introduce hundreds of kilos of base pairs and uh, you know large regulatory sequence of multiple genes simultaneously being stretched through this back transgene technology. So transgene has its own benefits, like they can introduce large sequences and also the generation of the different founder lines is very efficient. However, because the insertion is randomized, we can it is not easy for us to generate a stable line with a you know, stable expression level and stable performance, stable slow phenotypes between different generations. And we need to make many extra efforts to you know, generate a stable inherited lines with stable genotype between generations. So in this case, people have developed this safe harbor size like the ROSA26 that's commonly used, especially in the embryonic stem cell targeting and also currently in CRISPR case targeting based on chromosome 6, and also the H11 set and chromosome 11. So we can use CRISPR case based knocking in the SIP hover size and introduce the transgene construct in a certain position. So the benefit of this is that we know where the construct will be certainly introduced, and then it is easy for us to identify the genotype and whether there is multiple insertions or copies, and also we can stable the genotype between generations easily. So we so call this technology as super transgene or super TG. So in this case, we can avoid the complicated stable line construction process compared with traditional transgene. So the, the last strategy we want to introduce here is the point mutation through Kishna. So we can see that since most of the human genetic variants associated with disease are single point mutations or other than others like deletions and insertions, and also the mice and human genome is very similar, especially in the coding genes. So if this variant is a coding variant and it's also homologous between mice and human, we can introduce the corresponding mutation into the endogenous mice gene, and then we'll generate this homozygous and homologous point mutation of the gene. And this is likely to be a good disease model to study the function of the genetic variant and also be an ideal model for drug evaluation in this case. So here's a summary of the mouse model generation efficiency through CRISPR-Cas9 in German Pharmatech. We can see that 
Well, the first rate differs not very much between different types of engineering. The gold germline rate for knockout is as high as 70.5%. So you may wonder that this is not as high as what I would have displayed in the background, but this is the number of positive founders, you know, dividing the number of embryos in jacket. So this is a productively you know, important data, which means that on average, 100 embryo we injected, we will get 7.5 positive founders for knockout. And also, for whatever 100 embryos we inject, we will get 2.4 positive conditional knockout founders and 2 positive condition, for 2 positive knocking founders. So, in this case, this efficiency compared with these technology papers and uh, publications is comparable or, rapid, or even rapidly higher. So our capacity for model generation is very strong here in Germany. So we can customize models from your innovation and the after strategy verification by our leading capacities of our largest library, our full experience and the technology we have and to finally deliver you your customized gene non modification genome modified mice. We have the capacity to generate more than 6,000 mice every year. So based on our experience and our model generation capacity, in 2018, we started this ambitious but important project called the Knockout Hall Project. So we can talk from the name of this project that our goal is to generate knockout for all the protein coding genes near 23,000 genes in my genome. And also we can include some non-coding RNA like link RNA or micro RNA coding genes together. And also we have simultaneously completed the generation of conditional knockout lines like which means the flux lines most of the genes of most of the genes. So we are now over half of the process of this project and then we have already become the lar largest genome engineered model model resource all over the world. We can see that we have more than 20,000 of the shelf lines, which means that we have live animal, okra, preserved sperms or embryos of these strains. We, can, we have more than 10,000 knockoffs, near 10,000 flux alleles, and uh, over 200 of create strains. And also some, we have other strains like gene humanization strain, strains also. So in combination, we have more than 20,000. And all these strings from the Knockout R project is in Black 6J GPT background with independent property right owned by GPT. So we can see the comparison of the major, the major worldwide genomics resources that Gen Pharmatech is one of the largest. We also did that the search engines for the customers and our collaborators to find the appropriate strains, appropriate resource of their research. So we can search by, you know, basically by strain or gene name, and also by signal pathways we generate in our own system. So we can see for the examples, this is one of the AMPK pathway and also the insulin pathway. So every protein or every gene in this pathway here is clickable and it has a super link to the page of the corresponding genes, strain or product. And as we talked later, as we talked before, about half of the products are off the shelf, which means that we don't need additional time to generate these models and we will deliver this animal in you know, three to four months to your hand. So for combination use of the flux strings, we developed multiple questions in our own property right. Like we have now more than 220 strings ready to use by the today. And we have separated these create strings into different application fields like in different systems or organs. And also we have a tool on our website to you know search for these strings by organs or tissues expressing these strings their organ or tissue specific expression or by their promoters. So here's a brief example 
that create strains to immune systems, we can see that we have the strains as 100 a 8 majorly for neutrophils and other myeloid cells knockout. We have CD8A cray for CD8T cells knockout. We have FOXP3 cray for T-Rex cell based knockouts, etc. And we have now over one third of these strains are up under. I'm sorry, over one third of these strains have completed the validation process and have a fully open product material for our customers to see whether this strain meets their criteria and is suitable for the research. And also, most validation of more strains is in progress under by ourselves and also our collaborators. So we do create expression analysis and pattern analysis commonly by crossing the query strain of interest with the reporter strain, which will not express fluorescence or express the first fluorescence be up before query recombination and the different fluorescence after query recombination. So in this case, this reporter mice will fully express GFP globally, but after the cross of create of interest, crystal of interest, some of the cells will, will be, the GFP coding sequence will be removed and some of the cells will express T tomato, the red process instead. So the expression pattern of this T tomato will represent the activity pattern of this create stream to be tested. So the commonly used methods include the process photomicrographs of the frozen sections and also in some cases, when we need to you know, tell between different cell types, we need to use immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry to fulfill this process. And also, we can do Western blot or RNA or quantitative RT -PCR, real time PCR to identify the expression level of the genes. And also, we will use flow cytometry, especially for the cell free lines introduced in, in, involved in immune system and the hematopoietic system. So here's a case when we validate our query string. We use this PDX1 knock-in query as an example, and we cross it with a reporter string we showed before. So we can see that in the query inactive mice, the section of the query inactive mice, there's only expression of the ZF string in pancreas, enter stomach, and duodenum. But when we analyze the CRE positive and the reporter positive strains, we can see that almost all of the cells in the pancreas is recombinating, and it display a red forces instead of a gray forces. And also signals are observed in enter stomach and duodenum, which is, which meets our prediction, because that PDX1 is a you know, master regulator of the Endoderm and some of the PDX1 positive cells will finally differentiate into cells in the stomach and duodenum. So this will this will display the activity pattern of this PDX1 query in gene format. So for all the product strains we in gene format, we have a strict quality control standards for this mice. We do PCR genotyping and MTCON sequencing, especially for the knocking strings like flock strings, create strings, and other tool strings. And also for knockings and flocks, we we'll sequence through the entire inserted fragments, like the sequence between like the sequence flunking lock piece and all the and the, all of the knocking set. And we for knockings we do quantitative PCR copy number analysis and single copy verification to make sure that this product string is of the stable genotype and will be stably inherited between generations. And also, we we'll do tender repeat analysis. So from 2019, we have already had over 120 publications using KOAT mice, including the knockout mice, flux mice, and the cray strains. You can see that this also, inc also includes some high impact journals like Nature, Cells, and Immunity, etc. So the knockout project and the live streams we generate here is certainly a great resource for the science community. And also, we can have more from the knockout project strings, the QAP strings, 
like we can dig into some disease model from these strains and use them for further applications for disease study or drug evaluation in this case. And because we owe this intellectual property of these strains, it won't you know, generate some intellectual conflicts when we do perform customized services or evaluation tests for our customers or industrial collaborators. I'll simply go through several different disease types for introduction of the disease models from knockout our project. The first I want to talk about is obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the most commonly used and well-known obesity and type 2 diabetes model by genome modification is the OB and DB mice, which is firstly you know, identified and uh, isolated by Professor Coleman. And then Professor Fredman have identified these causing genes like OB, the lab gene, which is the code, which code encodes lactin, and the DB gene, which encodes the leptin receptor, lab R gene. And then the leptin pathway is fully dissected, and it is very important for you know, disease control and the studies about obesity. Other than these traditional models, we can you know, dig in and, uh, gener and generate novel obesity and type 2 diabetes models from the knockout project. For example, the LMS1 mutation. The LMS1 gene encodes a centrosome protein which involves in cellular regulation. This, this gene's mutation in human is highly related to the Alstom syndrome. So with you know, tests including vision loss and the kidney disruption, cardiomyopathy, and the obesity to, from childhood. So in mice, the mutation of this gene will cause a severe obesity, which starts from eight weeks from eight week age, and uh, it will gradually gain more weight as time increases. And also, an important and uh, unique characteristic of this strain is that the food intake level of this LMS1 mutant mice dramatically increased from eight week age to 20 weeks from the period we tested. And also the blood glucose level and blood insulin level is significantly higher compared with blood type control. Also, this model develops a hypercholesteremia <coughs> phenotype. As we can see that the total cholesterol level, the HDL and LDL level, all significantly increase compared with the wild type control. But the triacylglycerol level is similar to the wild type control. And also the liver function is disrupted in these models. Since we can see that from the blood chemistry analysis of the liver function, and also the pathology analysis of these models suggest that there's all droplets formed in the liver of the LMS1 knockout in 21-week-old mice. And also, oil rice staining suggests that the exist of the droplets and also the serous rice staining indicate that there's liver fibrosis in these models. And also, this process of this non-alcoholic fat liver disease can be accelerated by fatting this MS1 mice with Western diet and they will shorten this stage for more than 10 weeks to generate the NASH model based on LMS1 mutation. So here's a simple summary of different induced or genetically modified obesity or type 2 diabetes models. We can see that this LMS1 model has its unique characteristics, like it has a moderate and continuous hyperglycemia and diabetes phenotype, and also the glucose tolerance is impaired. Then the complications, now we can see that it has a severe fatty, fatty liver complications, but with no diabetic necrosis. So it is better than the DB strain if we don't want to study the you know, kidney disruption. And also, we know that because DB male mice will die around six months old. LMS1 mice don't 
have this problem, so we can use it for you know a study of elder ages. The second related disease we want to introduce here is of hyperuricemia. So we know that hyperuricemia is the second large metabolic disorders in all peoples, and also it has a, about 20% prevalence among people all over the world. And in about 10 of the patient, 10 percent of the patients, hyperuricemia will develop into gout, which is a severe arthritis and will you know, decrease the life quality of the patients dramatically. So the model for hyperuricemia is the central. So the, the causing effect of the the causing of the hyperuricemia is based on the pseudoization of this UX gene which expressed in most mammals to prevent hyperuricemia since it can transfer the urate, which is a metabolite of purines, into anatonin, which is more soluble in water and can be easily excreted from renal excretion. But this gene became a pseudogene in human and some primates, which means that in human, the terminal metabolite of purines is urate and the water solubility of urate is not as good as anatonin. <coughs> so this in human some primates it will easily become a hyperuricemia phenotype. The treatment of hyperuricemia is based on two basically two methods. One is inhibition of pure oxidation, like this cyanine oxidase by allopurinol or other drugs in similar mechanism. And all the other ways to inhibit the uric acid resorption by kidney, which is or usually the inhibition of this URAT1 protein or SLC22A12, which is this encoding gene. So we can knock out the UOX gene in mice and generate um, UOXKO mice it will be an ideal model for hyperuricemia. We can see that after knockout, the expression of the UX is absent in the liver of the mutation of the mutant, homozygous mutants, both male and female. And also the serum uroacid level in either male individuals or female individuals is significantly higher compared with the blood type control and the heterozygous. What's more, if we administrate aliparino in the drinking water of these mice, the blood, the serum uric acid level will be decreased and uh, be similar to the well type controls, indicating that this is a ideal model for hyperuricemia and for drug evaluation. The third example I want to give here is Systematic lupus erythematosus, which is one of the most severe self immune diseases of the world, causing multiple systemic damages. So, the exact mechanism for SRE is not identified currently, but it is highly related with a hyperactivated immune system, including activated T lymphocytes, inhibition of regulatory T cell functions and also poly, uh, abnormal proliferations of B cells and uh, large amount production of autoantibodies. And this all together will directly cause cell and tissue damage in different organs like kidney, skin, lung, brain, and heart. So the prevalence differs between different regions or countries all over the world, but it is relatively high, like 10 to 150 cases per 100,000 population. So current treatment of SRE based on the inhibition of the hyperactivity T cells or B cells, like so it can be simply simply separate <laughs> simply classified as B cell targeting or T cell targeting therapies. From pathways, it can be inhibitors for of toll-like receptors, interferon alpha, <laughs> brutal kinase, or genus kinase. So from our knockout our project. We can. We also have this SLE model by the knockout of TRX1 gene, which encodes a DNA exonucleus, 
The mutation of this gene will lead to increased innate immune against the nuclear DNA, endogenous nuclear DNA as well as some action, some non-self DNA like the bacterial infection. And these released DNAs will cause of immunohyperactivation gradually by activation of the c gastein pathway and then cause a SLE-like phenotype. So in this knockout mice, also the, the expression of TRX1 is absent in spleen and other organs, which is not displayed here. And also, we can detect this increased anti double strand DNA antibody level, which is a self-immune DNA level, since as early as seven-week-old mice. And also, there's significantly increased uh, LT, AST, and LTH level in this match during different time periods. So it means that the liver function and the heart function is severely disrupted in this match, which mimics the phenotype of SLE. The last but not least, the models from Knockout Project can mimic some rare diseases and it's uh, valuable models for study of the disease as well as drug evaluation. So the one I want to you know, detailedly present today is the hemophilia. So the pathology of hemophilia may be very familiar for all of you. It's just that the blood, blood coagulation dysfunction caused by the genetic defects of mostly hemophilia A or hemophilia B gene F8 or F9. So hemophilia A accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of the patients. The prevalence to totally for hemophilia is one in 3.5 to 6,000 people. And this is actually recessive inherited among generations. So the basic treatment chemically in old days is from desmoparacin acetate to adjust the pressure of blood and the urine to increase the blood coagulation capacity of the patients. But now since the rising development of gene therapies, especially the AAV-based therapies, the patients have new hopes to you know, cure this porphyria disease once and all, especially this BMN 270 developed by Bell Marine is approved in the US. So in Gene Pharmatech's Knockout All project resource, we have this F8 knockout as well. So the phenotyping of this strain suggests that the factor eight activity of norm of plasma is dramatically decreased in either female mice or male mice with F8 mutation, we can see that the activity is like 3% to the normal plasma of well type mass, suggesting that this is a moderate level hemophilia A model. And also, in a tail cut experiment, the bleeding weight and bleeding time is significantly increased in the knockout mass compared with well type. And also, APTT experiment suggests that this model is uh, ideal. Hemophilia A model and is suitable for drug evaluation. So due to time issue, we cannot you know go to more we cannot go detailedly through more disease models, but we have other validated disease models from knockout out project, including diseases like methamelonic acidemia, Wilson disease, phenylketoyuria, thalassemia, black gene storage disease, etc., and also some of the immunodeficient disease models in at least are not listed here. So if you have interest in these disease models, so please contact us. The last, other than the knockout all project, I want to briefly introduce and go through about the gene humanized models, since today's topic is also about the genetic modified models and their applications. So the reason why we use lab animal models in biomedical research is that we want it to be a stand-in for human, so like humanization. So the humanization is can be you know, interpreted in different scales, like gene scale, cell scale, or system scale, or microbiome, or environmental scales. So because today's topic is 
mostly focus on genome modified mice. So I will introduce about the gene scale humanization. So for gene humanization, we commonly apply these two strategies into production of the strains. So the first one is introduced already in the first part, which means that we introduce this human gene with a transmission termination signal to the five prime of the endogenous mice gene to be replaced. And in this case, after integration of this human gene with polyordination signal, the human gene will be expressed and the, the transmission will terminate here, preventing the mice gene to be expressed. Then the final product of this humanized gene will be a wholly humanized gene with only human protein sequence expressed. In some of the cases, it is you know, worthwhile to do this, especially when the protein function of human gene and mouse gene not differs from not differs a lot from each other. But in some of the cases, we need a more elegant method, which means that we replace the sum of the mice coding gene with human coding genes. For most of the cases, if monon checkpoints or membrane proteins, we replace the extracellular domain coding sequence of the mice with the extracellular coding sequence of human. And then we will generate this chromatic protein, which also Commonly, the extracellular domain of this protein is humanized, but the transmembrane and the intracellular domain is remains mice sequence. So the benefit of this case is that, especially for evaluation of some antibody-based drugs like antibodies and ADCs, etc., the recognition is rely the recognition relies on the extracellular domain's recognition and the the little difference between mice and mouse and the human will fill the binding of the antibody drug with the protein. So this humanization can help us to fulfill the binding of this humanized accessory domain with the drug antibody drug of interest. But the maintenance of intracellular domain of mice will not influence more with, about the downstream signal transduction pathway. So in this case the physiological and the biological process of this mass is least introduced, is least influenced. So our humanized mouse models project called the Drug Screening Mouse Project aims at developing over 700 strains. And most of them are, you know, humanized strains, like human immune checkpoint mice. And also we have breed these mice together to get double target or even triple target or even tetra target mice strains for evaluation of different drugs like ADCs or multiple target antibody drugs. And also we have the common and popular strains with two different back commonly used background. Other than black J background, we have LBC background, which has a unique or different immune system behavior or characteristics are compared with black six strains. So giving our customers more choice. Other than the immuno checkpoint or immuno oncology related target size, we also have humanized models of meta metabolism related targets. Let's take PCSK9 as an example, which PCSK9 is an inhibitor of LDR R recycling and then it will lead to you know, hypercholesterolemia and uh, NASH and other diseases. So targeting the PCSK9 is a good therapy for lowering the blood cholesterol level and uh, curing the disease. So we generate two different humanized PCSK9 lines, one with the Free prime UTR of the human gene and the other without the free prime UTR of this gene. So the schematic of the strategy is shown here. So in this one with the free prime UTR, after analysis of the homologous mice with this target knock-in of humanization, we can see that in the homozygous only human PCSK9 is expressed instead of the mouse PCSK9. And uh, we can only detect human PCSK9 in the plasma in the homozygous PCSK9 humanized mice, but not well-tech mice. So 
We use Inclusivity, which is a positive SIRA drug targeting three prime UTR of PCSK9 to target our humanized mice. And we can see that in the humanized mice, the plasma LDL level is significantly decreased compared with Valpat. And also during different time period of drug administration. Also, using the anti PCSK9 antibody drug, positive drug, to evaluate the model also suggests that the LDL receptor level dramatically increased in the humanized mice, but not in the well pet mass, which showed that a Western diet feeding. Last but not least, we have humanized HA2 mass models from COVID 19 research. Since we know that normally the COVID-19 won't influence the well-type mice, so we need a humanized ACE2 mice as a receptor for COVID-19 infection of cells. So we have multiple different ACE2 humanized models, like chimeric humanization or fluid humanization or humanized overexpression models, and in different backgrounds for different approaches and different for mechanism study or therapy evaluation. So here's the characterization of this full full and humanized mice model. We can see that the knock the knock in of humanized ACA2 construct leads to the expression of humanized ACA2 in different tissues and organs. And after infection, we can see that the body weight of the animal decreases in the first days. And then it goes through a regular recovery and the body weight in, increase in the late days. And also, after infection, one day and three days, we can see that virus loading in lung is significantly increased. And also, we can detect COVID 19 neutralizing antibody in these infected individuals. Our humanized ACE2 mice have already helped development of some and testing of some drugs and leads of COVID-19. Like this collaboration with the CS Kumi Institute and the Western China Medical School in Chengdu, China, we have helped them to analyze the drug efficacy of this MI9 and MI30 chemical, chemicals and see that these String, these chemicals are useful for inhibition of the infection and proliferation of COVID-19 in vivo. So to sum up this webinar today, we offer a one-stop solution for biomedical research, both for scientific and uh, industrial customers. We have the world's largest genome engineered most model resource including conditional knockouts, conventional knockouts, and tool strings, including CRIS, and humanized strings, and immunodeficient strings. And we can also customize strings according to your requirements using our experience and the large capacity for model generation. And also, we can also provide you germ-free options for all these models. And then some related services like mouse breeding and cryopreservation. preservation and the preclinical drug efficacy test and the phenotyping can also be provided in gene phenotype. Thank you again for your attention and joining in this webinar. Well, after this webinar, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded onto YouTube, on YouTube. And if you have interest or some questions about this webinar or the contents or the business, and products offered by Gene Pharmatech, you're very welcome to review this record again. Thank you again for your attention and your attendance in this webinar.